Hey guys, how you doing? This is False Bulls One Two Three, and I think this is um day three of my moving story. Excuse me. So I talked to my um HR person. Her name's Hazel. She is one of the nicest people you've ever met. And so we like you know kind of worked it out a little bit that I you know I got my okay from her. I got my okay from Paula, my um manager. And so I basically just have to put it in the transfer request now to, and actually talk to the people. And I'll have to, like, you know, talk to Hazel sometime this week to, like, start working on that and getting secured. Besides that, my mom was like, hey, by the way, I talked to my landlord. I talked to everyone else that I need to talk to. And if I can get my caretaking paperwork up and signed, I can start, like, you know, I can live with, be a living caretaker with my mother. So, it would only be two hours a day, so even if I'm working at, like, you know, Walmart at the time, I can still, like, you know, come up, come down, like, you know, visit mom and spend time with her. And that way, if I do it like that, then I can also, like, you know, get paid a second job to help, like, you know, pay the bills. And that would be really nice to be able to do, so. And it would just be stuff that I do anyway, like, you know. Go to, my, go to my mom's house, make a dinner, and, like, you know, clean up a little. So that's definitely something, like, you know, it's already something I'd be doing when I was there anyway. So it'd be nice to get paid for it. So a lot of my packing process is going through all my shit. Thinking, which of this stuff do I not need? Because I have a lot of detritus. I have a lot of, like, you know, extra things. I like to, I'm a materialistic person. I like to have, you know, I like to get stuff. So I went through all of my, like, you know, books today, and I kept all my textbooks, I kept all my, like, books that were really important to me, and I can probably, like, you know, parse a few. The, um, stack of books I have here on, like, you know, my nightstand, I literally just use those for decoration. Will I ever read, let's see, Pliny's Natural History or Scenarios of the Committee de Dalat? I probably will not. However, I wanted to bring you at least a little something a bit more fun than, I don't know, me being a sad boy or showing you literally every single piece of paper I've kept since middle school. So I thought that this video is all about condens condensation. Not the right word. Condensing. There we go. And so I'm bringing you my top 10 books that I own. I own. So this is not going to count any of the books that I owned previously in Medford. This is just going to be literally the 10 books that I have currently in my personal library that I love or have a special important meaning to me. So I didn't have any particular way to list these. So these are listed in size from smallest to largest because that's how you stack books. So first up is the Everything Yeah, the Everything Bartenders book by Jane Bar Jane Parker Resnick. I can say words. Those are words that I'm saying. And this is my first cocktail book that I ever got. And I don't remember where I got it from or if it was a gift or anything like that. But it basically just taught me how to like you know make a lot of my favorite cocktails and it's a really great like you know start a book for that. So let's see this is from Alabama Slammers to Walking Zombies. The Everything Bartenders book features over 600 easy to follow recipes for both alcoholic and non-alcoholic drinks. So they also include a wide variety of like you know virgin drinks and non-alcoholic ones which actually is really nice because you know there's a lot of people who they can't really drink at bars, they're underage, they're recovering alcoholics, they're old or something. I don't know why people don't drink. But, or the designated drivers, that's another reason that it has nothing to do with my blatant ageism. And it would be, it's really nice from a, like, you know, accessibility standpoint to have more than just the standard Ginger Raj, Ginger Raj, Shirley Temple, sorry, Shirley Temple, Tom Arnold's Ginger Roger is not a non-alcoholic beverage as far as I know. But it's nice to have more than just the standard Shirley Temple or like, you know, Club's Seltzer. And so I love mixology. It's a passion of mine. And so 
I just really enjoyed having that book because it taught me a lot of stuff about, like, you know, mixing cocktails and things like that. The next book I have up is Inayasha, Volume 1. So, for you non-weebs out there, Inayasha is a manga series written by Rumiko Takahashi. And so Rumiko is... I apologize if that was, like, over-accented. Anyway, Rumiko, she is a manga writer who also wrote Romno One Half. Which is the story about basically a dude that whenever he gets splashed with cold water, he becomes a chick and there's fun gender bending and way too many waifus. Inuyasha is different and therefore it's better. No, I'm joking. They're both really great manga series. Inuyasha is the story about a 16 year old girl who's apparently the reincarnation of some random like Shinto priest from like feudal ages who falls down a well and then has to deal with her own personal cat dog demon. Who is literally just a giant piece of shit. And it's 50 books long. And they don't even fucking kiss in the whole damn thing. Everyone else is getting glad happy with their handsies. But they're just like, we're saving it for marriage. Uh huh honey, it's been a ship since day one. We all get it. But basically Inuyasha is just an amazing like action horror type. Comic, and it just really shows the depth of Rumiko Takahashi's writing. Also, the English dub is trash, and if you listen to it, I'm sorry for you. I really am. Also, don't play drinking games with an anime or you will die. So, my next book, so this is book three, is How to Disappear Completely and Never Be Found. And this is written by Sarah Nickerson. So, How to Disappear Forever and Never Be Found is... Kind of a coming of age story is about this girl who literally goes to this island to figure out what happened to her uncle and her father who mysteriously vanished before she was born. And one of the things I love about the book is just the multiple perspectives, the use of comics in the story to actually provide like a secondary perspective and just like the pictures and descriptions in general. It's probably one of the, my most favorite books that I ever read as a kid. And I actually first got this. I was living with a... Let's see. It was my, friends, my family and I were living with a friends of ours. And my mom got this at, like, near the bookstore. And it was just a wonderful sense of escapism. I definitely recommend, like, you know, how to just look forever and completely... How to disappear completely and never be found. It's one of my most favorite books I ever read and... You will not be disappointed by this one. Next up is... Now, I want to say that this is not my most favorite book by the author, but this is the only one that I had of his with me. So, The Grasshopper Trap by Pat McManus. So, Patrick F. McManus was a columnist for Field and Stream who was known for his very humor, humorous like articles. After he started becoming a journalist, he wrote a series of memoirs that were just funny stories from his life, usually centered out his out about centered around his outdoors thing. And so he wrote, let's see, a good couple. Let's see, never sniff a gift fish, they shoot canoes, don't they? The grasshopper trap. And so I own quite a few of his books. They're one of my favorite ones to actually get just because he has a really funny writing style and he can make a lot of things that I'm not super interested in, like hunting and fishing, and make them very interesting. I got my first Pat McManus book when I was living, when I was staying with my Aunt Crystal for a few days because I was having her do a yard sale, and the book was part of my payment for helping her, along with a bar stool and that sack of res and that recipe sack that I told you full of the clippings from last from yesterday. So, I love Patrick McManus. He actually passed away, I think, last year or the year before, and that's really sad, because a lot of people don't even know about him. So, next up on the list is, let's see, Grimm's Fairy Tales. I bought this with a Christmas card at Barnes & Noble's. So, my least interesting of the book, probably the books I have, but... Now, I'm not particularly interested in this exact copy, I just love, like, you know, fairy tales. And it's actually a really... Now, Boston Nobles, they can do classics well. 
It's a softback. It holds up pretty well. I've owned this for a few years now. Read it like a couple thousand, couple times. And it has all of the stories, and at the end it has the Nick Penix, which actually explains some of the background for it. Another nice thing is that a lot of classics will include short biographies about the context of the one, and that's always nice, because you get a lot more information about the book itself, and you understand what, how it has its importance into it. Now, I have German ancestry, and so I thought the idea of actually being able to read the original Brothers Grimm was really wonderful, because that got to show me kind of part of a culture that I'm not only a part of, but still have that nostalgia for, I guess. Next up is the King is the Holy Bible, King James Edition. So you can't quite see this, but this is my personal Bible. I got this when I was 16 for my birthday, and it was honestly, I loved it. I was raised very religiously, I was raised in church, and so I was really happy to have a very, well, I would consider a mature Bible. So, really standard. You got your faux leather here, you got the golden, so sort of golden embossed pages. And mine is in fact actually monogrammed, but you can't see it from this distance. Now, I have no problem like with people who want to read a different translation of the Bible. I just prefer King James. I think you know it's the original translation. I like the style and writing of it as well, because I feel that a lot of like you know the phrasing in the in like some of the newer ones is it has the same message, but it doesn't have the same sort of impact as the way that it sounds now let's see so i guess my favorite bible quote is give me a second it's proverbs i can't tell you the exact chapter and verse right this moment a merry heart doeth good like a medicine but a broken spirit drieth the bones i like that because it's from the same chapter that has let's see it is better to eat crust in an addict than to feast in great halls of tribulation which is basically just the same model from the kids City Mouse and the Country Mouse, but wisdom is wisdom no matter what culture it comes from. Anyway, my next book up is Will Will, Will, Will I cannot speak today. Will Write for Food. There we go by Diane Jacob. So basically, this is just a really great primer about the basis of food writing. She talks a lot about like you know the works of other famous food writers and. How to like, you know, really grow as a food writer. I think that's, I've really enjoyed it. I actually got this book from a, essentially, rummage sale that OCCI did when I was in college. They had a bunch of old textbooks like these in the back that they never, no longer used. And so they were selling them dirt cheap. I got this, and then I also got a I mean, Jack Papon autobi autobiography. This book has been really useful. I've been trying to like, such a learn more about... To get more proficient at food writing. If you guys are interested in my food writing, because I know I forget to mention it sometimes, but I am a culinary major. I do have two blogs out there that are dedicated to that. I'll try to put some links in the description. They're both from Blogger. It isn't like, you know, the most biggest or like well-known blogging site, but it's free and they don't ask questions about me, which are my two favorite things. <laughs> so the first one's called RJ's Eats. There we go. And it's basically restaurant reviews. I only have two articles on there right now. But when I get down to Medford and I get more stable, I'm going to have a lot more articles written. I'm actually really enjoying doing that blog, and it really gives me some of the enjoyment that I get from cooking. It's more vicarious than the, actually, like, you know, making lobster thermidor, but it's still part of the industry, and it makes me happy to contribute. The other blog I'm doing is called RJ's Diner. I don't currently have any articles published on there yet, but once I get, like, you know, a more stable home environment where I can actually cook, <laughs> then that's going to change. I'm going to try to post a, re a recipe for the Samhain pie I've been mentioning, but we'll definitely have to see how everything goes, and it might not be as, like, you know, I might not make the pie that day. I'm not really sure. I'm going to try to, but... It really just comes down to like, you know, what I have the time for, what I'm going to be doing. And I might make the pie and not write the article, you know, there's a lot of moving parts. But anyway, I'm going to put links to RJ's Eats in the description, because I actually have something that you can like, you know, bite into. Pun intended. And on to the next book. So this one was for, I bought because of my genealogy research. 
And this is actually the only first edition book I ever owned. But there's a good reason for that. This is 75 Years of Progress by L.L. Greenwald. Which will probably mean absolutely jack nothing to you. However, L.L. Greenwald is my great 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 grandfather. <laughs> so my great grandma Robinson, she, let's see, she married a man named Gaylord, which, pun, which is a delightful name. But it has some unfortunate connotations in today's society. Now, before she was Gaylord, she was Greenwald. And she had a father who was named Lorenzo Leonidas Greenwald. <laughs> he was, let's see, he did a few things. One of them included being the postmaster of Hastings, Iowa for a long period of time. And on his 75th birthday or at least when he was 75, he published an autobiography called 75 Years of Progress. So this is an autobiography of one of my ancestors that was written talking about the life and time, about the, like, you know, how his life was in the 75 years that he existed. And so this is actually a really cool book, and I would love to do some, like, reading excerpts from it if you guys ever want to, like, you know, hear about it. A lot of it doesn't give me too much information about his actually actual family life. One thing I remember reading from the introduction, let's see here, was I was never able to actually find any information about his aunt, Abner Heaton. I know that they lived in the Ohio River, that they lived around the Ohio River Valley, and that she had lost two of her children, but I was never able to actually get any concrete evidence past her being mentioned in the book. But I thought that was really cool. I thought it was a really awesome artifact for, like, you know, my genealogy. And this really inspired me to, like, one day get a lot more, in like, get a lot more ep articles and evidence on my family. Because when I pass away, I want to have some sort of genealogical resource that people in my family can use and actually have the evidence to, like, you know, show us, like, all the things they did. Because... I have a lot of, like, you know, really distant cousins who were really well known as... So I have one cousin who, one thing they mentioned in the obituary is that they were a really great watercolor painter. And I would, like, you know, love to see examples of her work and do things like that. So, this is just a drop in a bucket, but this is just an evidence of the kind of cool things you can find when you do your family history. Um, next up, this one is definitely special to me. I got this as a gift from my... Let's see. What's it called? Academic instructor. I can never remember these words anymore. Once you don't use them in common, like, you know, every day, it just pops out your head. So, this is James McNear's Pie Cookbook. So, I am a pie baking fool, and I love... Oh, it's one of my favorite book pieces to make. And this was given to me by my chef... By Chef Duvall. She was one of my... Let's see, cooking instructors at OCCI. She was actually one of my main cooking instructors. I had Chef Torres the first quarter, followed by Chef Joe Folk, who is now running his own bakery in town. And then Chef Duvall was my international alacor and garmanger teacher. So she finished up our classes after Chef Torres became the headmaster of the institute. And she left an inscription for me. She writes, Baker on Ryan, best regards, Chef Duvall. And it was really great. It definitely, you know, inspired me to, like, try a lot more things with pie. And it's just a really great, like, you know, what I'm trying to say, like, you know, a starter cookbook for, like, learning about a lot of really great pie recipes. Some of my favorite pies to make are probably pecan. You'll hear that a lot from me. Hootsiana sugar cream. And let's see, I'll, I'll need one more because I, I love making sugar cream, but... Oh, dear. <laughs> So pecan, sugar cream, and what's another one I make all the time? I was going to say Dutch apple, because I make Dutch apple way too much. Let's see. So, my last book, and this is my newest one that I bought. I was reading a PDF version of it at first, but then I decided, you gotta spring for the right copy. Now, depending on, like, you know, what side of the internet you're from... You've either heard the fucking shit about this book, or you have literally never fucking heard about this. 
Also, I'm sorry, YouTube, if you gotta demonetize me, do what you gotta do, but I'm speaking from the heart. And this is House of Leaves by <laughs> Moxie Danya Danielaski. I apologize to the author of this book for how horribly I butchered your name. House of Leaves is basically, I'm trying to think how to describe this. Imagine that Edgar Allan Poe is reading, is narrating a shot by shot re description of the Blair Witch Project. But halfway through that, the, te the television screen glitches a little, and the next thing you know, you're watching Fear and Loathing in Las Vegas. That's basically the best way to describe it. Sorry, not Edgar Allan Poe, Lemony Snicket. Lemony Snicket describing the Blair Witch Project. It's very meta, there's a lot of tangents and digressions. And one of the very unique things about it is its use of footnotes. What, so there's multiple narrators in the story, and one of them, the guy who's really the main narrator, because there's one guy who's named... What the hell is his name? I can never remember. <laughs> Hi, let me just stand there and look at this while I'm not, like, reading it for you. Johnny Truant? No, that's not it. Anyway, I'll have to like edit that in and tell you whatever the guy's name is, but we have that guy, and then we have this old guy named Zapato, who just writes, who's like writing this super long book about this documentary that came out, but the thing is, the movie's not real. It never existed. The entire book is fake. But see, then there's like, you know, the bridge narrative, this Johnny guy. And see, his story is also coincidentally fake. So, like, there's a lot of, like, meta-ness and a lot of, like, you know, calling out the story itself. So, I'm going to try to find, let's see, just one page or two that can really... Okay, here's a good section. So, this was during, I think, chapter 14. It's a couple of pages in. And the book is about 700 pages. So, I'm just going to show this to you. And this is kind of like, you know, what it looks like. It just has a lot of really confusing, like, layouts. And that was actually done by hand by the guy who wrote it. There's other sections where it's, like, you know, scribbled out. Or, according to, like, the notes, it was burned with cigar ash or things like that. And so, a lot of the... Basically, imagine if E.E. E. Cummings wrote prose. There's a lot of stuff to do with, like, typography and setting and white space and a lot of other nonsense things. So, guys, that was my 10 favorite books that I own. Oh, 10 favorite books that I own. And I'm glad you enjoyed I hope you enjoyed it. I really the videos are getting kind of long now, but, you know, I just enjoyed talking to you guys. And I hope you enjoyed, like, you know, listening to my story stories and like you know what else I talk about these days I'm actually pretty happy about the quality that this like you know video came out as so hopefully you enjoy it too I'll do some editing make sure that I like you know tell people all those references and I'll make sure I have the link down below in the bio anyway guys remember to like subscribe and slam that notification bell if you're into that and I'm gonna be back with you maybe tomorrow maybe the next day I'm going to keep you guys updated on my moving story. <laughs>